Welcome everybody to a new interview of Homemade Muscle with Mike Gillette and today I have the honor of talking with a strong man, uh, a mind boss as his latest book was called and I'm gonna let you talk a little bit uh, about who you are Mike. What I would like to know like as a first introductory question is how did a frightened uh, little boy that grew up in a really a quite hostile environment, I would say, in, uh, uh, in an abusive environment, and how did this guy that even attempted suicide at age 18, right? That's correct. So how did this guy turn out to become the man he is today? <laughs> um. I think that uh, fundamental to uh, to anyone uh, being effective in in pursuing something, you know, pursuing something meaningful, uh, requires self belief, and it starts there. That was something that uh, until about age nineteen, I didn't really have. And it was someone else sort of seeing me and believing in me that made the idea that I could do something, uh, be something, it made that real. And that's really where it started. And because I think uh, my, my early circumstances were on such a specific end of, of the spectrum – that when I started to feel as though things could turn around for me, uh, you know, and, and not to sound so cryptic, I mean, basically, I met a girl, and it, it was this girl who saw something in me that I did not see in myself, that I had never seen in myself. And it was, you know, spending time with this person, this was someone who embodied a lot of the characteristics that I would have liked to embody. I just didn't think that I could. You know, this was somebody who was um, comfortable with herself. This was mm. someone who seemed stable. This was someone who was intelligent. This was someone who was nice to everybody. This was somebody who just seemed to exemplify character to me. And, and all of those traits were very appealing, and, and they were something that felt uh, you know, different uh, to me, just you know, sort of based on uh, the influences of my earlier life. So I, I was drawn to her. And in the uh, process of spending time with her, uh, you know, we, we do things that couples do. And one of those things is we start going to church because that's what she did. I started going to church with her initially only because it was another way to spend time with her. Uh, ultimately, Everything I was hearing, you know, the the, the positivity of, of that setting, the positivity, the message, um, I started spending time getting uh, serious uh, with the Bible, and that was it. That was the single most pivotal uh, factor for me, uh, reversing course in my life. It is not um, glamorous or exciting. It's it's so traditional that mm -hmm. uh, it almost sounds cliche to a lot of people. Yeah. I don't care. Uh, that's that's how it was for me. Yeah. And once I once I started reversing course, it was very fast mm -hmm. because I, I had yeah. a lot of catching up to do. I, I was looking yeah. for all of the pleasant and the positive uh, that I had missed out on, and I started building that for myself. And that's that's how we get to today. There's a lot of other details along the way, of course, but that's that's the single uh, most specific catalyst. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I, 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 I can relate with that as well. So like your wife, I think, was the influencer, but the, the trigger for me seems to be, maybe I'm wrong, uh, your suicide attempt, right? Because I can relate to that into how my accident, which was something seeming negatively negative at the time, was the slap in the face I needed to like get unstuck. So sometimes bad things I think seem bad, but they are, they can be uh, a trigger for something a lot better in life. Uh, very well said. And there is a uh, the old Buddhist proverb 
uh, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. You know, we have to be ready to yeah. hear what we need to hear or to experience things in a particular way to spur us on in a productive direction. Now, unfortunately, not everyone gets the uh, the opportunity. Well, maybe they get the opportunity, but they don't see things the way that, you know, maybe you or I and, and other people who have, uh, you know, fortunately uh, – use those events as something that, that ultimately became something positive. Um, you know, and, and once you do, you realize that you would never write that part of your story out of your story okay. because if it got you to where you are and where you are is an amazing place that you want to be, you realize all of those things are, are critically linked, mm -hmm. which, you know, for, for anyone listening, anything that's going on in your life that, seems like uh, you know it's kicking you in the ass um, try to look at that a different way you know is, is is it kicking your ass because that's how you're looking at it is it what you're letting it do so we'll stop yeah just don't 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 do that anymore just put on the brakes get out of the car look around and figure out what direction you want to go mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, I totally agree with that and um, like one thing I say is that I'm fortunate for like my uh, my event, my experience that triggered all this, and a lot of people don't get that. And uh, people who can relate always get it like instantly, like you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, um, and, and we're sort of we're jumping into some stuff, and I didn't get to say what I really wanted to say uh, mm -hmm. at at the start, which is. It's it's awesome to be talking to you today. I I love what you do. I love your message. I think you're inspiring a lot of people, and it's it's an honor to be talking to your audience. Thank you. <laughs> so I've been looking forward to this conversation. Me too. Me too. I've been following you the last months, and I was also really looking to this interview. So uh, I want to talk a lot of stuff, so much stuff that I don't know what to ask first, but I'll start with some exercise stuff which are more relative and we can go back into some more uh, spiritual or <laughs> life related stuff later. So uh, one of the things that I think people miss a lot nowadays in exercise and especially in bodyweight exercise is the connection of mind and body. because. Pretty often I get people that tell me, you know, I can't build muscle with body weight exercise. And I think the main problem with this is that uh, a lot of people are missing this link. Most people ask, you know, how many reps and how many sets should I do? Nobody really asks, like, you know, what are the internal cues I have to be feeling? What is the intensity I should go through? And for me, that's something sort of easy that that's it comes natural to me. Uh, I can like push my body a lot. Maybe it has to do with the fact that I grew up as an athlete. And uh, what I see with other people, as, like for example, I go to calisthenic parks and I see people doing a lot more reps than me and, you know, being uh, a lot more under, under, underdeveloped than me. So, you know, there's too much momentum used, too much bad form, so you can, you know, cheat the exercise and do more reps. Uh, nobody's in the zone. People, you know, are just doing the sets so they can get over with the sets. And I think that's a very important missing link. Most people are not talking about nowadays. And I thought of you as one of like the best persons to ask this question. Well, the uh, what you raised so many salient points. <laughs> really good stuff. Uh, let's start with uh, the mechanics. Uh, to begin with. And I think that there's uh, two uh, aspects just sort of, to, you know, to the mechanics or, or sort of if we were to watch the physical execution of what you described. And the first of which I think that so many people are kind of disengaged from their bodies. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the great thing about, uh, you know, this Internet age and the abundance of information um, you know, so, something that I didn't have the luxury of, uh, information was, was sorely lacking when, when I was young and starting out there, there's so much now. So you're getting a lot of people 
into gyms or uh, into a CrossFit a box or the calisthenic park, you're getting people out and doing things, which is wonderful. But the the physical base that people you know of my generation would have had just from school, from uh, mm. physical education classes in school, uh, there was a lot of stuff we used to do that it simply doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Uh, you know, those things are diminished, and, and of course, the when you scale down uh, programs such as that in order to <laughs> not injure the deconditioned mm. youth, the youth become even more deconditioned. Yeah. Because ev everybody suffers in that scenario. So the people who are heading out to the uh, – to the calisthenics part, you know, we'll just keep it focused on the body weight stuff, as you mentioned. Um, they don't really know what their body feels like when it's working. They don't understand how to control it. It's it's kind of like an awkward partnership they have with it. The, you know, they their brain does not speak to their body with authority. It does not control it. It does not make it what to do. Uh, so, the uh, the result is. A general disconnect, and in that case, everything just sort of suffers. Uh, uh, you know, form goes out the window because you can't feel when you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, the other thing is if you don't intellectually know what what's correct or what's not, uh, that's a problem as well. So, you know, people who are are looking for some body weight expertise might uh, you know do well to connect with someone such as yourself, who's really good at that sort of thing, and. So, you know, there's the intellectual awareness, but then um, you talk about people, you know, banging out reps. And um, I encounter this a lot because I uh, connect frequently with the gymnastics community, specifically within the realm of strength training, which mm -hmm. is surprising to a lot of people because most people consider, well, gymnasts, goodness, aren't they just so strong anyway? It's like, yeah, but when they get stronger, it's just terrifying. You know, when, when, but the thing that they do is they participate in this uh, multi-directional, multi-velocity uh, sport for years. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they get this tremendous base and everything they do is extremely uh, scrutinized so that uh, they shouldn't be doing things incorrectly. So they, they develop a tremendous amount of, of awareness. But what's... Um, so often the case is there's you know certain sports have their own dogma, and gymnastics is very much uh, that way. Gymnastics is a universe that doesn't talk to anyone else, you know, within the you know sports uh, development community. Mm -hmm. So they do the same thing over and over. They they bang out reps like nobody's business. Yeah. So you have an athlete that is doing something that is sort of rep centric. It's the same movements over and over and over drilling them for precision and then for strength development, strength in quotes, because it's not really developing strength. Uh, they do more of the same thing, mm -hmm. just more and more and more reps. Now yeah. we're talking about things that these kids could have been doing since the age of six, seven, eight. So if you're still doing the same thing, is your body adapting? Of course not. All you're doing is making it tired and beating it up. Yeah. So uh, if, if you're not varying the stimulus, you know, you uh, use the specific term a uh, moment ago, intensity, you know, if, if you're not adjusting that as a variable, uh, adding stress into the, into the mix via that variable, you're not doing anything except getting tired. Uh, and if you're someone in the calisthenics park that already had bad form and mm -hmm. you're getting tired, now your pre-existing bad form is just you know a terminal condition. Yeah, uh, and you're basically building that into uh, your your mental frame of reference. So yeah, the the problem I think is people don't connect with their body, they don't communicate with it, uh, you know, from the brain outwards, and they don't necessarily know the objective. Um, if I do a lot of reps, I understand that. Reps are mathematical. Uh, making a movement difficult, really uh, challenging myself with, with holding the correct position you know, for perhaps a, a longer duration, uh, adding some type of uh, difficulty via you know, angle manipulation, adjustments in, in leverage, or external resistance, 
um, well, that's all unpleasant, so I'm not going to do that, or I don't really know how, so I'm just going to keep doing what I always do. And that's that's where things can kind of go off the tracks. Mm-hmm. And then what happens? We've just been doing endless reps, so we're beating up our joints. Yeah. One of my uh, uh, old stock phrases with gymnasts is I say, look, you are born with a certain amount of repetitions in your body. Mm-hmm. Do you want to waste those, or do you want to spend them wisely? Mm-hmm. You know, you've got guys like you yeah. and guys who train seriously want to spend them wisely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just 30 years old and I already feel my, my body becoming more sensitive, uh, yeah. which is um, why okay, I'm… A piece of advice, mm-hmm. if you're 30 years old and you start talking about how you, your body is feeling more sensitive when you're talking to me, <laughs> it, it just – it makes me want to throw my coffee cup. <laughs> okay. But, but, so continue. <laughs> Uh, so you youngsters. <laughs> so th- that's one of the reasons. Like uh, I'm really fascinated by by what you do because you started the strongman stuff. You know, like the 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 metal bending things and all those uh, crazy world record stuff. Like at age 47, am I right? Uh, yeah, 40, 46, 47, right. Um, now, because there are going to be some obsessives out in your audience, uh, <laughs> as soon as you start talking to somebody who, who bends anything, they're immediately going to want to know, well, what, what did they bend? What was the thickness? What type of mm-hmm. steel? Um, I have a lot of friends who are extremely serious benders, mm-hmm. uh, and they're awesome. I love them. Uh, I watch their exploits on YouTube. It's super cool. I'm not that guy. Mm-hmm. I do just a, a bit of bending enough to sort of, you know, hang with that community. Mm-hmm. But most of the stuff I do is actually sort of outside of that. Uh, th- they are things that I would much more characterize as uh, mental feats rather than physical. Yeah. You know, because they're either you know they're dangerous or they're scary. Uh, you know, high propensity for injury. Those are the things that uh, interest me the most. Um, and those are the things that uh, you know, I've sort of become known for. But it was actually the more traditional feats that I was first exposed to, which kind of brought me into that whole world. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it was at 46, and it was uh, it was a field trip, really. Uh, I took several days to uh, travel to a workshop that was being held by Dennis Rogers, who everybody in the strongman community uh, knows. Uh, he's done so much TV and he's been all over the world and he's done so much to sort of, you know, further the cause. And then he had some of you know, some high level students of his at this workshop, guys who are, you know, kind of legendary in their own right. Um, Pat Povolitis, uh, Chris Ryder, Mike Bruce, uh, Logan Christopher was there, uh, might be a name, you know, mm-hmm. um, Logan, in a sense, I, I kind of relate to a bit more, uh, just in the sense of he does feats of strength, but he does a lot of other things as well, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and that that's kind of his deal, you know. He's sort of uh, all over the place, which is awesome. Um, but there were some really serious, and there were some guys there that no one ever hears about, but they're just they're terrifying. But and that was sort of my entree, and I loved what they do. Um, most of the traditional feats I never do because I'm, I'm not that interested in them. I'm interested in, in unusual things. But what they do with those feats is what was most compelling to me. And those feats for them are an entree into other worlds. So at the time I was introduced to that, I was still working as a bodyguard. That's a very insular universe, traveling all the time. I was not interacting with humans. I was interacting with billionaires. Mm. And there was something very attractive about the ability to have some sort of means to communicate with people, you know, wherever they are. And, and communicating with young people is particularly uh, attractive to me. So, you know, these guys were in schools, churches, you know, prisons sometimes, and I just thought, yeah, if if I could if I could get to a point where I had a repertoire. Uh, and I had a message, that would be something that would be meaningful for me. So that's just, I do a lot of different things. That's one of those things I do. Um, uh, I'm not an entertainer. Some of these guys do shows after shows, and that and that's great, and their their whole you know, demeanor and, and background is, is conducive to that. That's not me. Yeah. Um, I, I do extreme things to basically validate my methods, 
Mm-hmm. You know, if if you write a book called Mind Boss, you know, someone's going to ask you to step up. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, do you really, you know, have the ability to control your mind? It's like, yeah, I think I do. <laughs> so, uh, and then also when I do get a chance to speak to young people, doing things that terrify them, uh, that's my means of sort of, you know, gaining equity. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, and yeah. then we get to talk about things and that's just, you know, I... I get so much satisfaction out of doing that, particularly when I get to talk to audiences that are made up of kids like I used to be. Mm-hmm. You know, I did that just a week ago. Um, and you know, the, that's that's really what that's all about. So, yeah, 46, 47 when, when that uh, that stone got rolling. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm not I'm not one of those guys who's really interested in whatever it means to act your age. I, I do what I want, and I'm going to keep doing what I want for as long as I want. Yeah, I completely understand that, and I can relate with that. Um, so one of the things you do nowadays is being a mind coach, and could you elaborate further on that? Sure. Um, I think the simplest analogy uh, would be to relate it uh, to to the personal trainer industry. You know, everyone understands what that is and what is a personal trainer. Well, uh, it's somebody who meets someone where they're at and assists them with particular goals. Now, physical or personal trainers are always working within the physical realm. You know, does somebody want to get in shape? What does that mean? Let's define it. Okay, let's work on a plan. Now let's execute that plan. Does somebody want to lose weight? Does somebody want to train for a particular activity? Um Mind coach, which is, uh, I don't know if anyone else uh, is using that term, that's just something that I thought would be understandable to people, is really the same thing. Um, and my, my primary interest is uh, you know, working with people that either want to you know, push themselves farther in a, in a particular direction or solve a particular problem. And if I think I can help them solve that problem, I'll tell them, we'll work on a plan, we'll execute the plan. So the... Um, my largest constituency are athletes and it's both athletes in, in group settings and athletes one-on-one with athletes one-on-one we're typically uh, trying to solve a problem or multiple problems there are any number of exceptional athletes you remember from your, your athletic days there were always kids who were gifted yeah but yeah. something would seem to get in the way mm-hmm. so we, we need to figure out what those some things are, and then we need to get rid of them and, you know, and clear that out. I always tell people, you know, you, you run perfectly, provided that you're operating with the right software. Mm-hmm. Not everybody is running the right software. Sometimes that software is out of date. It's got some bugs in it, so we need to, you know, we need to replace it. Yeah, yeah. So um, a lot of people are looking for what's commonly referred to as mental toughness uh, training. And I don't really care for that term so much, but it's so prevalent that that's, that's, that's the term they use. That's the term I'll use because it's, it's sort of ambiguous. What is mental toughness? Yeah. Well, ask, ask 20 athletes, you'll get 20 answers. Um, and yet uh, I, I did several workshops here uh, this past month in Las Vegas with Cirque du Soleil. One of those workshops was entitled Mental Toughness. Because that that that's what they want. It's just sort of a, a frame of reference, but it can mean a lot of different things. I, I, I like that, your definition. <laughs> yeah, I shared uh, it yesterday. Can, can you uh, repeat it once and uh, tell us more about your way of uh, perceiving mental toughness? Um, you'll you'll have to give me a little bit more. I say so many things. It's it's difficult for me to keep up. With uh, myself. It it goes something like. Um, being mentally tough is not about uh, it's about how you deal basically with bad stuff in life. Oh, so some people see okay. them as opportunities, and you know other people right. see yeah. them as problems. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's it's the I, I look at mental toughness in the in the way that in the, what you were just describing uh, was a statement that uh, comes up a lot. You know, the glass is either half full or it's half empty. The mentally tough person sees possibilities. You know, other people see problems. You pointed that out right at the onset of our conversation, very uh, appropriately. You know, with uh, your your situation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you see it one way, and then when you start seeing it 
the other way, you know, in the possibility frame, that's when, when everything starts changing for you and, and here you are and you're awesome and, and you're kicking ass. So um, how many people don't get there? Many. That's what makes people like you special. Uh, and I thank you and I know I want as many people to feel special because they're doing special things and special things or whatever you say is special, you know, do what you want, do it as long as you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the other thing that uh, I say about toughness is it is a lifestyle choice. Mm. Anyone can be it. Mm -hmm. You choose toughness and then you keep choosing it. Yeah. 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 It's easy to choose it this week and then next week, ask yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, I mean, so ultimately what we're talking about is just discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Making yourself do what you know you need to do because. Even if you're pursuing an amazing fun goal, not every aspect of it will be amazing or fun feeling. Of course, of course. Like, and uh, so basically you help people define their goals and show them how to achieve them. Uh, I think that the reason that people fail a lot to attain their goals can, like for an example, it's about, like you see the same thing in exercise. Uh, as I said before, you know, it's the lack of focus uh, uh, an even more important factor is the lack of passion and, you know, like not going all in people like do uh, half hearted attempts to do something. And, you know, they, they're always keeping back and they're always looking for that, like secret, you know, supplement or method or when the, the funny thing is that if they spend that same time, they're spending looking for that secret method and uh, supplement or whatever, uh, the biggest part of their goals would be attained. And I know that because I did that when I was young. And, you know, now yeah. what I see is that as I uh, become more uh, wise or experienced, uh, that, you know, it's about basically mastering the basics, like the 85% of it, at least. Right, right. Yes, yeah. so, so, so many uh, good nuggets of truth in, in what you just said. I don't know if this is the case uh, in your country, but here in the United States, we have a very interesting phenomenon, uh, which is we have so many commercial gyms, so, so many. And when uh, people meet me, um, I guess they sort of feel obligated to talk about certain things. One of those might be fitness, you know, and, and uh, most Americans are self-conscious about their fitness or their lack of fitness. Um, but they'll say, hey, gosh, Mike, where do you work out? And, uh, and they'll say, I, I belong to such and such gym. And it's obvious that they have not been to such and such gym mm. whatever, uh, for quite a while. <laughs> um, but so many, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I go to the Y, I go to this place, I go, or I'm, I'm a member of, I'm a member of. And, you know, no, I don't say, well, gosh, maybe you should actually go um, because that would be uh, indelicate. But it's the idea, you know, we join the gym. Okay, good. Got my gym membership. <laughs> now my life goes on as usual. But what's interesting, though, is that there, there's the other part to that, which is there are people, rare, that actually go to these gyms. And they've been going to these gyms for a long time and mm -hmm. yet you wouldn't know to look at them and that gets back to your observation which is people don't have a plan they don't have goals they just sort of stroll in you know and it's that same sort of mindless execution we were talking about in your first question mm -hmm. they, they sort of go through the motions of what they think it means to exercise or what they think it means to work out and uh, okay clock says I'm done you know, I did my 45 minutes or, or whatever, and then they leave. And nothing else changes. They still drink the same amount of alcohol. They still eat the same amount of crap. Uh, and surprise, surprise, nothing visible takes mm -hmm. place. Now, some good things may be going on in, inside of their bodies, and I hope it is. But that's what I see for the most part. You know, either people join a gym and – never go after the first couple of weeks or they actually do go but without any sort of strategy yeah 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 and and that's a shame 
because if they're putting in the time, I mean, I want them to see some results for that. But mm -hmm. there's, as you know, even amongst the, the people who populate the personal trainer universe, there's precious little uh, knowledge there. Yeah. You know, ev everybody is getting rubber stamped with the same information. The information is was outdated 30 years ago, it's, which means it's still outdated today. Mm -hmm. And all of that is kind of shocking because the information's out there. I mean, everything you ever needed to know about mm -hmm. getting faster, stronger, leaner, you know, bulkier, whatever it is that you want to do, it's out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, from multiple knowledgeable sources, but people still don't seem to uh, connect effectively yeah. with that information and not a lot changes. Yeah, true. And like, I, I like exercise because you know that basically everything in exercise transfers in life in general. Like, and all this, you know, applies to not, not even, not only exercise and diet, but also, you know, uh, business success and basically conquering any kind of goal. And like one of the reasons I like uh, I liked your stuff. Uh, first time I found you through your book uh, Rings of Power was it the title? Uh, That's it. And yeah, like I really liked it. And one of the things I liked was that there was like no fluff, like no extra bullshit. You know, just to make the book bigger or you know I don't know fancier or more marketing um, uh, efficient. <laughs> so. Uh, I think it is like sort of a blessing that we live in this eight, day and age because we have all this information. But like, you know, um, the advantage is that the, the disadvantage of all this is that, you know, there's also so much distraction out there. So it's really difficult like to separate, uh, you know, the what is truly valuable in terms of knowledge and everything and what is like just bullshit and marketing and you know fluff this is true um what one of the things that's been interesting with the uh, the rings of power book and uh, i appreciate uh, that that you liked it um i i would have guessed you would just based on everything i've i've seen and, and read about you i i think that we're we're sort of kindred spirits when it comes to training. But what's interesting uh, is I've seen this book uh, come out and you know, it's released by a, a major publisher in the fitness realm, uh, Dragon Door. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this, this whole sort of democratic review process that uh, Amazon has. Now, Dragon Door sells the book. Uh, other uh, outlets sell the book. But most people gravitate towards Amazon to buy absolutely everything, and uh, myself included. So I see these reviews start to appear, and uh, you know, so, some of them are from people that I would consider fitness luminaries, and and they pretty much they get it because you know it's it's a simple book. It's all about strength. And the book says this book is about strength. It's not about gymnastics. Mm. We're just using a gymnastics tool. It's not about doing gee whiz exercises that look cool. It's about a very specific uh, structured approach to strength building, which is movement-based and is also designed to have a low barrier to entry, no expensive equipment. So when, when people look at the book and don't read it, they just look at the pictures, which I think is probably <laughs> a lot of the reviews based on what I've read. Mm. They'll say things like um, – it's too basic. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I just I say right in the beginning, mm. this book is basic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? But that becomes that becomes a point. And then other people say, I've seen all these exercises before, which mm -hmm. means you haven't read the, the chapter on the progressive resistance trainer, which is the bar accessory, which no one has ever brought to the marketplace before, and it's basically that that additional uh, destabilization bar that you suspend your rings from. Mm -hmm. uh, so you haven't seen it before because it's never existed until this point. Yeah. Or uh, those exercises are too easy. I don't even know where to go with that because anybody who's writing that isn't able to do what's in that book. Um, so the the thing is that you know that I I guess I continue to relearn these things is you can lead the horse to water. You yeah. Know? 
here's a book. It's like it's got pictures, lots of pictures. Just do this. And some people would still rather complain about how it's not a gymnastics book. Not that they would ever do gymnastics because, golly, that's hard. Mm -hmm. But they just they just want to beat up this book yeah. rather than actually do the work. Mm -hmm. And they'll and the, the next book will come out and they'll beat up that book <laughs> and the next one. And what they're doing in the meantime. I'm, while they're you know writing you know scathing ultra hipster uh, cynical reviews on Amazon, is they're not working out. <laughs> yeah, I mean just um, reaching, just conquering the basics and doing twelve reps with perfect form and all the basics is, for me, in my opinion, something that takes at least three years of focused work. Yet uh, I don't think anybody does that. Like ninety percent of people don't do it because if you would do it. Uh, physically, you would look uh, for, like me. Because, for example, I've been training three years. I was five years inactive. And all I'm doing is still uh, striving to master the basics. I do a few more uh, fancy stuff, but it's mastering those basics is what uh, gives me more strength on a daily basis. And I'm, st I'm still like, I still haven't mastered the basics in all exercises with perfect form and, you know, perfect mind to muscle connection and intensity. Uh, I, I think that's, that's one of the keys is that um, we're such a, uh, a stimulus focused uh, culture. You know, you, you mentioned all of the distractions a moment ago, and that, that's that's one part of the problem. And, and one way that it manifests is we get bored so mm -hmm. easily. Nobody has the patience to perfect anything. And the irony is that um, – and I've, I've sort of lived through this in several iterations of my professional development – when I was known more as a uh, tactical trainer, uh, when people would find out who some of the elite personnel that I had trained, they would say, oh, show me that stuff. <laughs> like, like there's this special box yeah. where we keep all of the commando fighting techniques. Mm -hmm. And it's right next to the box where you have the everyday fighting techniques for everyday people. You know, yeah. everybody wants the secret sauce. And so it goes with physical training. What exercises do you teach to the commandos? Mm -hmm. We just want to do commando exercises. You know, and the elite of anything are simply people who do the basics, the essentials, superbly well. Yeah. You know, and, and they have no problem continuing to master those things. You know, the elite power lifters, what, what do they do? In their spare time, they go to workshops on squatting and deadlifting. Well, they've been doing it competitively for years. But, yeah, on the chance that they may learn one more mm -hmm. thing, they're still drilling down. An elite gymnast does the same stuff that, well, uh, much of the same stuff as the 10-year-old. Yeah. They just do it so much better, and they just drill it incessantly, and everything is, as you say, it's perfect. It's technically correct, and if you don't have the discipline to get yourself to that point, you know, what's the difference between the scale practiced by the five-year-old piano student and the 25-year-old virtuoso? Yeah, the, you know, A-flat is still A-flat. Those scales and arpeggios are the same. They don't change. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just how connected are you with your instrument? How connected are you with your body? And what is the quality of the sound that you're creating? How much control of that sound do you have? Well, it's the same thing in athletics. How much control over all of the variables are you able to summon by virtue of your incessant commitment to mastery? Yeah. You know? But nobody wants mastery. They just want a six-pack, and they want a pill. <laughs> Yeah. Because everyone keeps saying there's a pill for it, mm -hmm. you know. So we're so turned around, you know. The uh, you know the joy of moving for movement's sake. We don't want to do you know. Exercise is one of those things that is is perceived as a drudgery, yeah. and that that is the fundamental failing in mm -hmm. uh, in mentality. 
and I know that you know this, and you know it very well. Um, when I, you know, from, from 1985 through most of 89, when I was physically broken up from a climbing accident and I could not train, all I ever did was dream of training. Mm-hmm. I wanted to run, swim, lift weights, punch things. I wanted to be the guy that I was before. And because that had been taken away from me, in a sense, I felt completely disconnected from life. It was horrible. Um, so the the relationship I have with training is different than the average person. It is – it's absolutely essential. Mm. Uh, you know, if, if someone says, you know, what, what are you training for? You got a record coming, you know, attempt coming up or anything like that. It's like, I'm training be- because, mm. um, what gym do you train at in my garage? Mm-hmm. Who do you train with? Nobody. How long have you trained like that? As long as I can remember, you know, it's, it's just that thing, you know, for you, I mean, you train at home, mm-hmm. you know, you know, because you know things about training that you can get it done wherever you are. Mm-hmm. You know, an informed mind uh, with the appropriate amount of intense intent uh, will get things done wherever. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, other people are you know, writing spurious comments uh, on YouTube about <laughs> people who are actually doing things. Um, you know, they could be training. Yeah, yeah. So uh, how do your workouts look nowadays? What do you do? Um, they tend to. Uh, I tend to train six days a week, mm-hmm. and I tend to do uh, nothing. Uh, you know, sort of conceptually mysterious. I push one day, I pull another day, and then I squat another day, mm-hmm. and then I do it again, and then I'll take a break. Um, and if I go really hard on any one of those given days, I might take an extra day. Uh, That is not an obsessive approach in terms of adhering to a particular uh, mathematical plan. And within each of those days, the pushing and the pulling and squatting, you know, uh, you're going to see a lot of uh, variation, primarily because I'm 53. And, you know, I may get on um, a kick where I'm doing a particular exercise a lot in the course of a month or so. Uh, That's unusual, but sometimes. um, And I need to be able to incorporate as much variety as I can simply so that um, I'm I'm one step ahead of my injuries. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, very few people have have seen all of my training apparatus, and what those that have always point out, you have a lot of different pieces of equipment for seemingly accomplishing the same purposes. And I said, yeah, it's correct, hmm. and that's strategic. And it's because I'm always trying to stay one step ahead of injury, you know, or or training around something that hurts. Yeah, you know, that's that's just a byproduct of you know the life we lead, um, and I'm fine with it. So uh, that, that's basically it. Now, the um, I may be doing conventional lifts one week. I may be doing a lot more suspension-based training. Um, you know, I may be doing more ground-based. You know, uh, calisth- calisthenic. I mean, if I do calisthenic. Uh, type work, it's always, you know, with, with some type of intensity variable, you know, I'm, I'm adjusting angles, uh, I'm manipulating range of motion, I'm adding external resistance, and, and I'm usually adding resistance most of the time, because uh, lots and lots of reps don't agree with me. You know, I, I, I tend towards, you know, the, the lower rep end of the spectrum and, you know, making those reps uh, as challenging as I can. Mm-hmm. Either mm-hmm. through time or load or some combination of both. What are your favorite bodyweight stuff? Um, you know, I I just I don't really bond with exercises in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and and one of the reasons why is I found when I was younger, 
I, I would refer to, I really like doing X, I really don't like doing Y. Mm -hmm. So I would start not doing the exercises I didn't like. Now, yeah. I'm, you know, just like everyone else, what exercises don't we like? The ones that aren't as easy. Mm -hmm. And which ones should we be emphasizing? The ones that aren't as easy. Yeah, that's a great. So, point. yeah, so, uh, I mean, really, my attitudes about those exercises haven't changed. It's just kind of the way that I choose to identify them and sort of, you know, psychologically engage with them. Um, if it if it hurts, it's not my favorite. If mm -hmm. it feels good, it's my new favorite. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that uh, I've I've picked up lately uh, is a pair of handles that um, tip back and forth, swivel around their point of attachment. The, the mm -hmm. handles themselves rotate, and um, they they add a whole new level of challenge to ring movements hmm. because if you're sitting on top of them, if you're above the rings, so to speak, they, they want to uh, rock back and forth. Okay. Sounds and pretty And cool. so, yeah, you know, you add something like that to the, to the PRT, which Dragon Door is probably going to have on the market, hopefully in, in another month or two, um, which is that, that, are you, the bar in the book was actually a prototype. Uh, the finished product is is uh, quite an attractive little piece. It's much more lightweight, so it can you know go in a gym bag with your set of rings. Um, when you start combining things like that, one of the, the great things that happens is the um, sort of the the physics force you to fix yourself in terms of form. Mm. If you're sloppy. You'll pay for it because you'll get thrown one side or the other, and hmm. that's you know it, it's humbling. So the uh, the tighter, uh, the more control, uh, you're rewarded with a more stable platform. And if you it, if you try to uh, use a little bit of momentum, uh, you will be punished. Yeah, Sounds because cool. the the apparatus will take care of the discipline for you. Interesting. I'm gonna check that out. Maybe also add it later on the screen right yeah, now. Yeah, it's it's fun. It'll be um, it'll probably be less dramatic for you. Hmm. Uh, just because you've developed so much control. It's uh, but for people who uh, really sort of struggle, even with um, you know, like a TRX, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. You can use them. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the uh, you know, sort of the uh, the horizontal body row uh, mm -hmm. example from from the ring book. Um, that is uh, a great challenge for a great many people for a long time. Nice. Uh, just sort of you know uh, of avoiding the you know the lateral tipping um, of that and. You know, all good training is core training. There's a lot of uh, core activity that, that occurs when you're doing all of those uh, movements correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Uh, what do you do diet-wise? Uh, how do you eat? Do you do um, any kind of fasting diets or what works best nothing, with you? Nothing really that complicated. I was, um, I was introduced to... Um, you know, sort of the, the ketogenic concept in 95. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was through a book written by uh, Mauro Di Pasquale, a Canadian uh, MD who was also a competitive power lifter. And he wrote a book that uh, really sort of spelled out the science behind that type of approach. Um, I'm from the United States. I'm from middle America. We like our carbs. Mm -hmm. A lot. Yeah. And uh, I'm also of that generation that, you know, in the 90s, you know, carbs were hailed as, as the thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember looking at ads in Muscle and Fitness magazine from a particular company that uh, was cautioning you against not getting enough carbs. Mm -hmm. And they had a supplement called Carboplex. <laughs> So you so you could suitably you know jack up your carb intake. Yeah, which is hilarious. <laughs> it is to indeed. Think about. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, that's where we were. And and the ad spoke of uh, the problem. You're probably getting too much protein, but not enough carbs. You know, mm. and 
what's hilarious is nobody gets enough protein. They have no idea yeah, yeah. Uh, how much protein uh, is really appropriate. There, there, there's kind of a protein bias in the United States uh, compared to other countries, you know, countries where they, they put a lot of time studying uh, nutrition. Uh, you know, the Eastern Bloc uh, countries and the Soviet Union were miles ahead mm-hmm. of everybody on that. And, um, you know, and they had the, uh, the trophies to prove it. Mm. So um, that was sort of my, my introduction to that concept. And I typically follow to this day um, a, you know, a high protein, you know, moderate carb. Um, I try not, you know, white flour and sugar. I, I try not to eat mm-hmm. uh, that, that that's more uh, for special occasions. Uh, I don't drink any, you know, things like soda pop or the, you know, god awful sports drinks, yeah. <laughs> uh, anything like that. Um, uh, at at present, um, you know, I'm I'm really trying to watch my uh, my caffeine intake, um, but that's that's very recently. So I'm I'm you know, kind of monitoring the amount of coffee I drink, that that sort of thing. Uh, I have not uh, consumed alcohol since the '80s. Uh, mm-hmm. I do consume the occasional cigar, mm-hmm. and the my advantage is I have such expensive taste with cigars that I can't afford to smoke <laughs> very often. So that that sort of takes care of itself, okay. sort of, uh, self-regulating, if you will. Um, but yeah, I um, I tend to you know if I feel like I want to eat what I want, I will eat what I want, and mm-hmm. then I will stop eating that way, and then I will. Uh, you know, eat more of a, you know, high protein, uh, low to moderate low, you know, everybody has a, a different idea of what, what, uh, low is. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not embellishing the diet with, you know, a lot of flour based products, you know, grain based products, uh, yeah. or sugar. So the, those carbs are typically, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, vegetable, you know, the occasional fruit, that sort of thing. So it's, it's very simple. Now, if I have, uh, like say a, a, a photo shoot coming up for Black Belt Magazine or something like that, then I'll I'll try to uh, you know manipulate things down um, just so that uh, I, I don't look too soft and sluggish, and and I'll spend a couple of weeks doing things that are really unpleasant. But uh, other than that, um, I don't think a lot about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I mean, I can sort of get away with that. Um, there, there was a time uh, when I had left law enforcement. I was uh, training full time and I was traveling a lot right after 9 11. And uh, I was not, I thought I was training because I was trained. You know, in my mind, I'm sure I must be working out because I always work out, but I wasn't. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the diet started to get loose from me. And there was a year where I was just in, uh, in pretty poor shape. Mm-hmm. And this was this was like 41, 42 age. Um, and then uh, once my schedules settled down, uh, I was able to kind of get things back under control. So I I know what uh, what it is to sort of lose control of that. And I think the older we get, it's easier uh, to to let things slip away. Mm-hmm. So right now I've got momentum on my side. I've got you know the power of habituation. You know simply I have particular habits. Uh, and as long as I can, you know, sort of maintain my routine, I don't even have to think about what I do. It's just sort of inherent. Um, and I'm, I'm not at that point that a lot of people are where they've got to kind of relearn all of that. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a challenge and, and nobody likes that. So I, uh, one of the secrets to life, of course, is, you know, enjoying the journey, you know, appreciating it while you're in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I do that in a variety of realms. One of those is, you know, I enjoy eating, uh, I, but I also enjoy not thinking about eating, you know, not obsessing about eating. I enjoy training, but I also enjoy not having to worry about training. I know when I'm going to train. I, I like having the resources to train wherever I go. You know, so if I'm home, I've got it covered. If, uh, I'm in Vegas on business, I know what gyms I can go into and work, you know, and pay by the session. I, you know, I know they're open 24 hours. I just, I, I like knowing 
uh, that I have the means to take care of business. And if I'm going some other place, I have a bag of equipment that's just basically travel uh, training accessories and off I go. I, I just I have a routine. I have a means to anticipate what I want to do, so that uh, you know. I, I know that you recently talked to Steve Maxwell. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's there's a guy who's he's got his whole uh, training plan figured out for sure. Always. Yeah. You know, and and there there's so much freedom in that mm -hmm. because you know all of the stresses associated with that activity are just gone. That problem is solved. Yeah. You know, he can you know devote his resources to solving other problems. Yeah, yeah. R routines and uh, preparation is basically everything in life, right? Yeah, and we all know it. And you know how many of us do it? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'll occasionally get, you know, I'll I'll do a uh, a workshop, and someone will come up to me afterwards. You know, and and there's two kinds of people who come up to you after a workshop, and maybe you've lived through this. You know, they're First are, are the people that were like, hey, that was amazing. You're amazing. Thank you. And, and those people are great, and they keep mm -hmm. us going. Um, and I've been that person. I mean, when I like something, I, I really like things. Uh, and then there's a the kind of person that comes up that needs to remind themselves that they don't need any of this, whatever this was. Mm -hmm. Whatever the topic was, they're fine. They don't need it. Yeah. Well, they'll come up and say, yeah, that was, uh, that was fine. I, I already knew all that stuff. And you can look at them and say – in your mind, because you're too polite to say it out loud, but you're not doing any of this mm. stuff. You know, it's, uh, I, I posted uh, w one of my recurring rants on social media the other day, which was basically, you know, if you know the answer, you know, uh, if you know the solution, but you're not actually executing the solution, you don't really know the solution. Mm. You know, everybody can say, yeah, I know I need to work out, but you're not working out. So you don't know. You don't get it. Yeah. You don't get things until you're doing things. Yeah. You know, yeah, I know. I, I, I need to, uh, to plan better. Well, are, are you planning at all? No, but I know how, well, th then stop talking. Yeah. I think that's, you, you either yeah. do things or you don't, you know, talking about things is not the same. Mm hmm. And all we do now is talk about things, or worse, complain about things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a major problem. A lot of people know so many stuff, and you know, they just stay in theory. Mm -hmm. And everybody, uh, not everybody, but a lot of people understand everything on a intellectual level, but on a experiential level, there is no understanding at all. And I think that's like uh, on your path of knowledge, like it's good to like learn a lot as you're. Um, trying to develop, but after a certain point, you have to like pause and start simplifying and start applying and start seeing what actually works. Otherwise, you yeah. always keep on uh, learning but not really applying anything. I, I think that's extremely uh, right, extremely correct. And I've been at, at various points in my professional development where I felt as though I, or I guess in retrospect, I would be in what you would call a accumulation phase. So when I was, uh, you know, when I was primarily focused on being a tactical trainer and I was trying to be the best tactical trainer uh, I could be, there, there was a point in time where I believe I had more instructor certifications in more use of force topics than anyone else in the United States, maybe anywhere. Mm. Uh, and I sort of became focused on that because I realized, hey, I have all of these. I don't think anyone else has all these. And um, the problem is that I was the, – the more that I was sort of focusing on, on adding to that uh, collection is that it was taking me away from the couple of things that I did very well. And you know, I have enough uh, in, you know, platform skills that – and I'm pretty good at explaining things. So I can teach a lot of things pretty well, but I would not be one of those central defining guru figures in all of those things. Maybe in one or two, um, and I was just very concerned about the accumulation. You know, when when I was uh, really rabid in uh, the martial arts, you know, 
really kind of in, in the 90s. I was still in my accumulation phase. And um, so much of that is repertoire that you never end up you know, playing for anyone. You, you're learning songs that um, you can't remember all the words to after a while because they don't really relate to you know the sort of functional application of those skills. They're just sort of interesting and cool and traditional and they're there you know they're sort of part of the vo vocabulary but they they kind of become like lost languages in a sense so uh, fast forward to you know 2006 through 2011 my life was uh, working you know bodyguard assignments or training other bodyguard teams and when it came to the you know the, the hand to hand skills i was training a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what I had accumulated. Mm -hmm. You know, everything was sort of distilled down to these very elemental basics, and they were very good elemental basics. And it sort of dawned on me at that point, even though I intellectually understood all of those things that Bruce Lee used to say about, you know, it's not about accumulating techniques. It's like, yeah, yeah, fine, don't bother me. I'm too busy accumulating techniques. Yeah. You know, I sort of I had to kind of, you know, come through that process my own on my own and and live it. And then at the end of it, um, I, I developed kind of a, a very detached relationship to martial arts in general, because at the end of the day, I had, you know, yes, I had spent my military time, my law enforcement time. And now here I was in this this really unusual uh, role, you know, uh, the bodyguard, if you will. Uh, bodyguards take that term. But that's, you know, it's like mental toughness. It's the vocabulary of, of, of what's most common. Mm -hmm. The, um, you know, in, in a bodyguard scenario, there's only a couple of options you're ever going to have. There's only a few things you're ever really going to do, none of which are particularly pleasant. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're not martial arty. They don't look pretty. You don't look cool doing them. And uh, people will get hurt very badly. Mm -hmm. um, and when you start living at that end of the spectrum, all of the other stuff just sort of becomes, well, that was interesting. Uh, it got me here, but I'm not – I relate to the topic differently now. Uh, so uh, all of the martial arts for martial arts sake stuff that was important to me once upon a time just kind of uh, dissipated in terms of its significance. I still love it. I'm a, I'm a big fan of all that. I have so many friends that are very high level and – and, and do amazing things, and they're wonderful, and I appreciate all that. Just like I appreciate many of my friends who do the more traditional feats of strength, I don't do it. I love it. I'm a huge fan of it. I express myself in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, distilling things back down to what is necessary, you know, you know, when I tell people to do that, I'm not just not saying it to say it. I've been the guy. I've been so many of the examples of the less effective, the less efficient, uh, the more confused uh, student, the more mm -hmm. confused pupil. I've, I've been that person in a variety of realms. So I'm not talking down to anyone. I'm like an older brother just saying, hey, trust me. I've been there. there there's there's a, a, a more effective way to get to where you want to be. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've, I've got all the bumps and bruises to, to prove it. Yeah, those are great points. Uh, another thing I wanted to ask you is, you mentioned before that you haven't drank any alcohol since uh, the 90s or 80s? 80s. 80s. Uh, yeah. You, you yeah. also like went... Like I said earlier on, when I turned around, I turned around hard. Mm. You also yeah. went through some uh, addiction with substances, right? At some point. Um, you know, well... Yeah, when when I was a, a youth, uh, up up through uh, up to the point I started going to church, yeah, I I was uh, drinking insanely, and I was using all manner of of drugs at that time. When I stopped, you know, I stopped. Mm. So was I an addict? Uh, I don't know because there's like all of these technical definitions. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I was an addict, I would have needed some sort of elaborate you know rehabilitation protocol. No. Well, I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. I just decided to not do it anymore. Yeah. And, you know, I, I know there's people that struggle with that and they're, you know, they've got pre-existing, you know, issues with how their brain is wired and it's very hard for them to stop doing that. I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've been very lucky many, many times. That's merely 
probably one of those. But yeah, um, the and and for me, alcohol sort of was was also synonymous with that previous life. Mm-hmm. So and alcohol was something that made me feel out of control. And there were times when I wanted to feel numb and out of control when I was very young and in distress and, and alcohol and drugs served that purpose very effectively. Uh, they were not helpful, but they accomplished, you know, that very short term goal. So yeah, th- things that I mentally associate with that particular time, uh, I do not participate in. Mm-hmm. Great. Great. Uh, which, uh, which makes people stressed out to hang out with me at parties. <laughs> <laughs> because they always think I'm watching. It's like, look, I don't care what you do. I, you know, I only care what I do. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. Well said. Um, so I think we have some amazing content. Uh, like, I think if people like this content as much as I do, <laughs> that will be a huge success. I would like to ask you three questions before okay. uh, we stop, unless you also have some stuff you want to add. Uh, question number one is. What would you be your best tip on exercise? And maybe if you would like to give a good tip on integrating mind and body, which is the problem we were referring to obviously. I uh, Great question. And I think the, those two elements uh, completely uh, are, they're, they're so related, it, it's, it becomes the same question, mm-hmm. or, or at least the same solution. And I think the solution is, figure out what you're willing to do, you know, or you know, you know, figure out what options seem productive, mm-hmm. you know, because there, there's some silly options out there. There's some very, uh, you know, time intensive options out there. But of, of the things out there that work, you know, like let, let's say that a, a person is uh, contemplating uh, joining a gym or joining a running club or a uh, training at home via some calisthenics book or video that they just got or are considering getting. Okay. So there's three different scenarios. Well, what is the, what is the one of those that seems the most attractive to you? That seems the most fun. You know, do you know anyone in that running club? I mean, would that keep you going? Do you know anyone at that gym? Um, Are you looking forward to spending some time just kind of with yourself, just, you know, get, getting clear on, on your goals and, and what's important to you in that case, maybe training at home. If, if we don't have a means of connecting with, uh, what we're doing physically on an emotional basis, uh, I don't think it's going to be successful. If, if it's something that is perceived as, uh, I have to do this thing, um, you're, you're already working, uh, you know, against a lot of things, you haven't even started training yet. Mm-hmm. And now it may be of those three hypothetical options, none of them sound good. I don't like any of them. Okay, what bothers you the least? <laughs> okay, running. Okay, then let's run. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I'm and I'm just picking running at random because I wouldn't pick running. I yeah. pick something that involves heavy objects. <laughs> uh, but you know, what Mike Gillette likes isn't necessarily what other people want. Sure. So, so to me, that's it. You know, what, what, what attracts you the most or bothers you the least and what do you have the resources to actually do? Mm-hmm. You Great. know, I mean, I'd like to have a, a rowing skull and, and start rowing, you know, at a, at a nearby lake, but I don't have the resources for that right mm-hmm. now. You know, the nearest lake is a long way away and, you know, the boat's expensive and I don't have a, I have a Mustang. You can't put a, a boat on top of that. <laughs> so, People get into things sometimes without really thinking through, you know, the execution part. Mm-hmm. So what, what, what do you want to do uh, or what could you want to do and do you have the resources to do it and to do it consistently? Great, great. You know, and d- do something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. Uh, regarding nutrition, most common problem is for people, you know, people want to either lose fat or gain uh, muscle mass. So what would be your like best nutritional tip to people like that? Um, you know, the, uh, I think most people know what they should do. Mm. They, just, they, they just haven't reached that point where they're willing to do it. Um, 
I think that uh, you know, he, here in here in the United States, uh, people just need to eat more real food. Yeah, that's that. I mean, that that's where I would start them. Mm-hmm. Um, it's you know, obesity is such a problem here that um, you know the typical things that that you would say if an athlete came to you and wanted to, and wanted to train with you and wanted to follow your counsel with nutrition because they want to look like you, um, you would start at a particular place. Mm-hmm. I I can't start there with the average person, not here in the states. Yeah. You know, yeah. we need to fix so many things. So you know. And we need to do it incrementally because the the alternative is just you know sort of this uh, you know overwhelming uh, sort of shocking transformative approach that's just gonna you know push anyone away. It's gonna yeah. be too much too soon, and and they won't want to do it yeah. because ultimately uh, there's so much that we're eating here in the states that that sucks. Uh, and so much that we're drinking that sucks that, uh, you know, to take it all the way immediately, uh, you know, people are, are just going to dismiss everything out of hand. Mm-hmm. So if, if we can start with looking at all of the pretend food that we're eating and to find ways to replace that with actual food, uh, we're going to be feeling much better. You know, I mean, all, all of the cascading effect of increased energy, decreased fatigue, uh, you know, more effective digestion, uh, you know, the weight's going to start uh, adjusting itself just based on that without even changing calories necessarily, mm-hmm. you know, just by manipulating uh, what is comprising the diet, you know, real food versus processed food. Yeah. That would be my first step for the average person. You know, for, for the high achiever, it's different. You know, yeah. then it's just make sure you're getting enough protein yeah. because most of us don't. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, how much do you weigh, uh, you know, make sure, make sure that you're getting, you know, at least, at least a gram of, of protein per pound of body weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if you can't, if you possibly can, uh, more is fine. Uh, you know, all of those myths about, oh, too much protein, your, your kidneys will explode and <laughs> this and that, you know, there's no scientific basis for any of that. Yeah. That's, that's never happened. Those were just arbitrary conclusions, uh, arrived at a long time ago mm-hmm. with, with no, uh, basis, uh, to support them. And yet, you know, we've here in the states we're really good at accepting things without really reading the fine print. Yeah, know. yeah. I mean, some of those studies were done on people with uh, kidney problems. I think like it was yeah. just hilarious. <laughs> yeah, and well, you know, it, it goes back to you know, don't eat eggs because they have cholesterol in them. Yeah, yeah. Dietary cholesterol is not the same as blood serum cholesterol, but no one really, you know, thought that one through. Mm. So. Okay, fine. That leaves more eggs for Mike. I'll eat a lot of eggs. Uh, I'm a huge fan of eggs as well. I yeah. eat at least three or four per day. Right on. So, so uh, if you can't grow it or if you can't uh, hunt it, don't avoid it. And make sure you're eating a lot of protein. Totally agree. Um, and my last question will be, what would you be your best tip on uh, success in general in life? You know, like for people who are either trying to find what they want to do in life as a profession or for even people who are already later in their path, what would be your best tip? Well, I think the, um, I'm very big on defining things. Mm -hmm. Anytime I start a class or workshop and I say our topic today is such and such, I immediately define that. uh, um, so that everyone, everyone is clear. Uh, success is really uh, something I view much the same way. Success for me is different than success for you and success for others. What does it mean to the person in question? Mm-hmm. Uh, not what it meant to the people you listened to when you were growing up. You know, you'll know you'll be a success when you have this, this, and this. What does it mean to be successful? What What is it that you want most out of life? And focus on those things. Um, you know, is it uh, is it more relational? Is it more you know geographical? You know, is is success? I want to end up living 
or retiring to this particular place. Uh, I want to have this much money. I want to have. Uh, I've always wanted to own a, a Picasso print. I've always, you know, this or you know, I've always wanted to travel to such and such. Um, okay, great. All all sounds wonderful. Now start planning for it. You know, how how do you get to that point? Mm-hmm. You know, and um, it's. Uh, I think the, the the interesting thing for me, and I can only speak uh, f- from me and, and some people I know, but uh, my previous life, you know, and, I, and I allude to this in, in Mind Boss, I have I have worked in the closest proximity to some of the most successful people on the planet, uh, in in the terms that most people use to measure success, which mm-hmm. is money, material things, and my belief is that once you start Start uh, focusing your your efforts towards goals. You know, wh- you know, it could be a fitness goal, could be a career goal, could be an academic goal, could be you know, quality of your your personal relationships. Anytime you start becoming strategic in one area, there is a carryover effect. You start to become more efficient in other areas. Yeah. It's one of the reasons that really high achievers tend to be really high achievers across the board Mm -hmm. um you know people that uh can do one thing particularly well often have several other things they do at a higher than average level just because they understand that excellence is as much a process as anything else Mm -hmm. so my success tip is define it define success and and once you know what success is, you're going to see a couple pieces that you probably need to uh, pursue. Well, make a plan for pursuing any or all of those things and experience the carryover that is sort of inherent in that process. Yeah. If no other reason, um, if I'm moving strategically forward towards my fitness goal, okay, how does that change the way that I look at myself? And if I'm changing the way that I look at myself, how is that changing the way that I look at the world? And how does the way that I look at the world now impact the way that I relate to other people? Well, all of those things are improving. So it kind of becomes this uh, ever enlarging uh, spiral that, that touches all of these different aspects of our life. So even if mechanically things aren't changing in every aspect of our life, every other aspect, those other aspects feel as though they are because we have this completely different lens through which we're looking at life. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when people say attitude is everything, it really is. And, you know, progress in one area changes you. And that change changes your attitude. And as your attitude, uh, we'll say, improves... Uh, or becomes more positive in its focus, then other things not only are improved, other things also seem more possible. When you feel crappy, it doesn't. you don't feel like you can get things done. Yeah. When you feel amazing, you start feeling like, yeah, I think I can do stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's that simple. Yeah, yeah. And the, the hard part is living it. Yeah, is making. You know, uh, there's truth, and then there's living the truth, making that truth real and mm-hmm. that's that's where most of us fall down yeah yeah another thing i liked in mind boss is that uh writing stuff on paper makes them real you say which is a yeah. thing i'm a huge fan as well thoughts are abstract R- writing things down makes thoughts real yeah yeah it's, and that's that's yeah, true that's an awesome quote yeah okay uh thank you for this really awesome interview uh, maybe it's we'll my pleasure we'll do one again in the future i'm sure i'm gonna have new questions for you at some point <laughs> Wonderful. So uh, thank you so much, and keep doing what you're doing. Where, where can uh, where can people find more about you? Uh, you can find plenty about me at mikegelat.com. That's uh, sort of my uh, my hub. There's free content there and uh, links to all of my my social media. Um, you can find Mind Boss on Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of my other programs are available through Critical Bench, uh, the Seven Strength Training Program being one of those, Strength Psychology, which you can also find at strengthpsychology.com. That's more of a video presentation.
continuation of much of the same concepts that are in the book Mind Boss. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a lot of strength guys. I know a lot of them don't like to read. So we, you know, there's there's different ways that they can get that information. You know, people like to read. Mind Boss is uh, is easy, and uh, for those that like to to listen and, and watch and rewind, uh, then strengthpsychology.com um, is is a great way to get get that same kind of information. And start putting that to to work. Okay, awesome. Thank you, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Uh, thank you. All the best to you.